Hi there, welcome to SolarWinds Lab Live. Yes, we are live. This is not a recording. So all the mistakes you hear me say over the next half hour or so, you hear in real time. My name is Thomas LaRock, and with me is Hansel Akers. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Hey, glad to have you here. So uh, as you know, today's episode is gonna focus on database performance monitor, right? And uh, before I get into that, I wanna mention again, live, we have a chat room, right? So ask your questions and Hansel and I can answer them right at the end of this broadcast. So if you aren't uh, logged, well, you have to be logged in. So there must be a chat window there. So again, ask your questions, get them ready for us. If uh, somebody, we have moderators, if the moderators aren't able to answer your question right away, they'll toss it to us to answer later live. Okay. So guess what? We have something in common. Do you know what What's that is? That? Actually, we have a couple of things in common. <laughs> Besides the fact that neither one of us need an Apple box, Let's talk about how uh, I came to SolarWinds through the acquisition of a little company called Confio Software that made a product called Ignite. You came to us through the acquisition of Vivid Cortex in December. Right. And uh, that was also the name of the product. The name of the company and the product were the same, Vivid Cortex. So that's one thing to come. We are here because our companies got acquired and they made database performance monitoring software. The other thing in common, is the first thing that happened after we joined is they renamed our products. So Ignite is now Database Performance Analyzer, the product you know and love. And Vivid Cortex is now Database Performance Monitor. And today we're gonna to help you understand a little bit about the difference between those two and why one would suit you better than the other. Uh, so first, before we get into all that, Hansel, tell me a little bit about uh, you know, what you were doing for Vivid Cortex, what your role was there. Sure, and you'll probably hear a lot of DPM in reference to uh, Database Performance Monitor. Nice acronym, um, but thanks, Tom. Yeah, I've been at Vivid Cortex um, now for a little over a year. Um, I started as actually the second sales engineer that was hired, okay. um, and then moved into sort of a managerial role. So I uh, manage a team now. We doubled in size of four. Um, so <laughs> three, <laughs> three, three rock stars, and, and then me somehow managing that team. Um, um, but yeah, so I manage that team. I make sure that we support our sales team first and foremost. Okay. And make and, sure that our customers realize value. And you said how long you've been with Vivid Cortex? A little over a year now. A little over yeah. a year now. Oh, wow. So you guys have grown quite a bit in just yes. a short amount of time. We have. So in the time you've been here since December, have you noticed, say, uh, been able to take advantage of a lot of the resources that SolarWinds has to offer? Definitely. I've been blown away by the resources. Um, you know, from day one, even like the acquisition team coming in and surprising us on site um, in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, it's been incredible. The support, the people we've like talked to and has just like been continually giving us support's been awesome. So uh, what I noticed is when we got bought was one of the first things was the ability to uh, get a lot more development time. Because there's only so many developers you have in your company, but right. when you come to SolarWinds, you find that you can actually have access to a lot more resources. And what that means is new features, uh, the stuff that you had on that wish list that you wanted to get into the product, now you can get there. And over time, we built things like uh, uh, the anomaly detection with machine learning. I'm not sure we would have ever done that if we had stayed just Confio software. So SolarWinds just has a ton of resources to put behind these products and help us get stuff done. Now let's talk a little bit about um, one of the key differences between DPA and DPM. So DPA traditionally is going to do your relational database management system. So we're talking your, your favorite, your Microsoft SQL Server. Also, you know, Oracle, uh, Sybase, I'm sorry, the artist formerly known as Sybase, that's your SAP. Uh, some of the big players in the space, right? That's what we focus on. We also do some MySQL, but again, relational database. But DPM doesn't really focus on relational databases. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so at a high level, um, DPM is a database performance monitoring software solution. Um, and we support today MySQL, Postgres, uh, MongoDB, Redis and Aurora databases, um, Aurora, Aurora database types. Um, and that includes both locally hosted and cloud hosted, right. um, managed and self-managed. Um, so today we're kind of um, covering that. Um, mostly kind of what we're seeing today is a lot of MySQL. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of the first database type we supported. Um, our founder, Baron Schwartz, uh, is well known in the industry, was uh, the lead author of high performance MySQL. So it's kind of our baby. He has a great following. I think that's what led to kind of the growth there. Um, and then, of course, we're seeing a lot more growth um, in Postgres and MongoDB recently. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that growth. We actually have a chart here from the DB Engines ranking. Uh, Eric, you can bring that up there. Perfect. 
So you can see at the top, the, the three, the, and this goes back seven years, you can see the legend on the bottom. You can see at the top there, your Oracle, the MySQL, which is owned by Oracle, and then Microsoft SQL Server. But then look at four and five, right? You got your Postgres, you got your MongoDB. Uh, so you, like you mentioned, you're seeing a lot of that in, like say, use it by your customers. Right, yeah, it's um, definitely becoming a lot more um, consistent. We're hearing on a lot of calls, hearing a lot of migrations to Postgres. Um, and then of course, everyone, everyone knows Mongo took off pretty quickly right away, right off the bat. Yeah, and just looking at the graph, you can see how those two, the, the orange and the first blue one there, Postgres and Mongo, how they are continuing to climb while those top three have kind of stayed steady. Like those are your right. old, uh, enterprise uh, relational database systems, they're entrenched, they continue to have a large share of the market. But you see the rise in the popularity of Postgres and MongoDB. I come across all the time, anytime I'm touching some data science stuff, uh, some um, Python code, they're always talking about hey, how easy it is for you to use Postgres and to get this stuff up and running. Okay, you had mentioned how you're a sales engineer. What did you do before you came to Vivacortex? So I was working for another startup um, in Philadelphia, I'm located in Philadelphia, um, and we were doing um, basically started as an MBAS, turned into PaaS in the healthcare space. Okay. Um, so we were uh, basically an interoperability platform for connecting healthcare um, data sources, mm -hmm. so EMRs, um, IoT devices, that kind of thing. Oh, that sounds that sounds good. So you were using uh, a lot of tools that maybe you bought or you built yourself. Um, it was all um, built. We were built on top of AWS, yeah. but we had a platform we built ourselves. Okay. It actually was built on Mongo. It was built on Mongo. Yeah. So my previous background, I was a data janitor, well, database administrator, <laughs> same difference. Uh, and of course my world was mostly relational databases, so Oracle, Sybase, and, and a lot of SQL Server. So when I jumped and joined Confio, uh, I had a pretty good understanding of that customer base because I was, I was a customer actually before I joined the company. Um, is that somewhat your experience as well? So you were using a lot of these open source uh, platforms, and then when you jumped to Vivacortex, like you had some experience in trying to tune that, yes? Right, so yeah, way back when, even before that most recent stint with the, the healthcare startup, I was in the healthcare space, so I was working pretty closely with some, um, some, some SQL backends there, uh, and then Mongo more recently with, uh, with um, it was called Cloudmine, the company. Yeah. And so the customer base for DPM then is really the people that are using a lot of Postgres and Mongo, right? Right, Yeah. right. Okay, uh, so let's uh, jump to another slide a little bit. I want to talk about the uh, architecture of DPM. So let's talk a little bit about this. I've got some questions and comments of, about what I, I've read, some of this great stuff that Baron has written. Uh, but maybe you could walk us through a little bit about how DPM kind of, how it gets installed up and running. Sure, um, so uh, you know, at a high level, it's an agent-based installation um, with a web-based UI. Uh, so we are hosted on AWS. Um, and uh, the data capture is down to the second in granularity. Um, but what this is showing us, um, again, I mentioned agent-based install, and we kind of separate into two, two, um, two boxes here. Um, and the agent's very you know, customizable in how we configure it. Um, but we can either install it what we call on host, and it means we're installing it on the database instance that we want to monitor or we intend to monitor. Um, and we can also install it off host. So for you know, those managed services like RDS, Aurora, Cloud SQL, um, for GCP and then Azure database for MySQL and Postgres um, in the Azure space, um, we install alongside of it. And what we can do is rely on existing informational views, um, like enabling performance schema or PG stat statements uh, to pull in all of our metrics. So that's what we're kind of showing here, either that left side um, installing directly on, um, and then that right side we're going to install alongside and then um, rely on some of the existing tables that we can pull from. Now, of course, at the top, we have that big picture of a cloud, right? Uh, so one of the key differentiators between the two products is that uh, DPM is software as a service. This is hosted, this is nothing. You're going to install an agent to do collection, right. but the actual application itself is something that is hosted, like you said, in AWS, whereas DPA is something you would manage yourself. Now, you can run us in AWS or in Azure. You can deploy us through the marketplace, uh, DPA through the marketplace, or you could host it yourself but it's not software as a service. So that's a real key differentiator between the platforms being uh, offered for support. It's also how does the service actually run? Right, and, and I mentioned those agents and their ability to be customized. Mm -hmm. um, you can flag them in certain ways to make sure that you know, only the data that you want leaving your environment leaves your environment. And what do you mean by that? Um, so we can flag it as, you know, we're, today we're capturing, we'll get into this during the demo, okay. um, but query samples, query text, you can make sure that you're you know, eliminating the capture of specific query text 
um, or eliminating query text in general and just making sure we're capturing samples with metadata and explain plans and that kind of thing. Uh, but right when you install it, right from the get-go, you can be sure that you're only going to be sending what you want to be sending. So since you mentioned it, enough talking. Let's start <laughs> showing, all right? Let's start showing what DPM really looks like and you can walk us through the product. Sure. And I'll just ask you some questions along the way. Okay, right. sounds good. Um, yeah, so what we're looking at here, and I'll just kind of cover it at a high end here, um, but this is the summary page. Um, that left-hand side is going to be your navigation pane. Um, so what we can do here is, is basically jump to all those pages that you're going to spend a lot of your time on. Along the top here, um, we can filter in our hosts. So this is a, a demo environment we have set up. We have some MySQL, we have some Postgres, um, and we have some MongoDB in this environment. You can see we're looking at 57 of 57 hosts right now. So by default, everything that I want to have in this, in this um, monitoring app. Um, and we're looking at the past hour. Um, I'll just call out by default, we will actually house 13 months worth of data. Um, I mentioned down to the second granularity, um, it kind of becomes less granular as we hold it and continue mm -hmm. to, to kind of um, you know, retain that data. Um, but that's configurable as well, so we can configure way beyond that. We have cu some customers doing three years and beyond. Um, so if I want to jump up here and filter on a specific host, a database instance, I can do that. I can filter on types of databases. So if I want to look at, you know, show me just my MySQL hosts, I can do that as well. I can also logically tag these to make sure I'm looking at only the database instances I want to look at. Um, but yeah, that's kind of it at a, uh, at a high level. Um, happy to jump in if you have any, no questions so far. Well, take us through some of the stuff on the left. Like I see Explorer. What does Explorer mean? Um, yeah, so I'll jump to Explorer. Um, what Explorer does, it's going to kind of give you this view of um, you know, organizing, rank, sort, filter, all of our queries by total time. Uh, you see it down here, this bottom portion. Um, and what I can do here is graph this, and I can also remove specific queries. Um, so what we're going to do is rank by default by the amount of time that's being consumed and we're going to rank them that way. So you can see that total time metric. Um, and what I'm doing here is, is I'm, I'm able to actually remove these and peel back these layers of specific queries. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we can do in addition to this is stack charts on top of it. So if I want to jump up here and look at you know, CPU utilization and see if I see a CPU spike, maybe I can identify a culprit, a specific query responsible for it. Um, so not only organize the work the database is doing, but um, help correlate that across your resource metric, metrics, your operating system metrics, um, those other database engine metrics that we're able to pull in. Now, am I looking at something that's for, say, all of everything that's been collected? Like, how do I know what particular node I'm looking at? Right, so right now we are looking at everything. Okay. Um, so we're looking at all of our nodes, all of our database instances, and that includes MySQL, it includes Postgres, it includes Mongo. Um, we can jump up here and use this global filter to make sure we're only looking at a specific Great. node that we want to look at. Okay. Um, so, and yeah, I wanted to ask about health. Yeah. Um, perfect. So uh, we have a, a health page here um, with best practices dashboard. Uh, so what we do is we'll bucket those into criticality. So you can see those critical warnings that we want to address immediately, mm -hmm. um, warnings, and then some more informational recommendations. You can see some of them listed here. So mm -hmm. um, for Mongo, we'll give um, some index analysis. So mm -hmm. if we have, find some queries that could benefit from additional indexing, um, we'll list them here. Um, but this view is really going to give you a nice aggregate um, list of you know kind of all of those best practice recommendations, whether it's related to security. You can see some of the ones that we've we've passed here in this demo environment, um, and then some wow. of those database engine the whole way down to query level where we have a custom built query parser that will give you recommendations on how to to make sure that your your queries are the most performant they can be. So so if it's gray, that means it's passed. Okay, good. Right. I was going to have you click on one. I wanted to see uh, actually the index. I'm curious about the index. Show me what that looks like. Sure. Yeah. So we can go into and from the explorer from the profiler, which we'll touch on in a little bit. Um, will be routed to query details. If we click on any of those, you know, it'll give us a lot of additional metrics about a specific query. Okay. Um, so here we're looking at this um, sharded counters um, dot find, um, mm -hmm. and that's going to be like our normalized version of it. Um, and what we can do is actually select any of these. These are sample executions that we've captured of this digested query. So I can select these. Um, I can look at that actual sample text now that we're pulling in. And as I scroll down a little bit further, um, we'll get some metadata specific to the sample execution. Um, so we get an idea of exactly where it's coming from. You can see the IP here. This ran for 1.86 minutes. Mm. Um, and then explain plan, and then we mentioned that index analysis here, which will pull up, um, give us some additional information on how to you know, improve this query. So I, I like how, so for latency, 1.86 minutes, what that means is from the user trying to execute all the way down to the engine, the engine returning it back to the user. So that's all layers rolled up. Um, so this would be the database's time for executing the so query. So just in the engine, right? 1.86. If you scroll down a little bit, I noticed there was the average latency, which was 47. 
Right. So just to give you, so that's the average over the last hour, but for the one we drilled into, that one was a little bit higher, 1.86 minutes. Uh, so now might be something you'd want to investigate further. Exactly, you can see some, for those samples that we are capturing, we have um, a lot of those that are kind of laying at the bottom. Those would be those faster, those faster frequent ones. And then we have these outliers here. So, you know, these are probably the ones, as you mentioned, that we want to drill into. Okay, so uh, I noticed alerts over on the left. I'm always interested in alerts. <laughs> yes, um, so if I jump over to alerting, um, and I'll show this in the health dashboard a little bit as well, but we okay. capture a lot of events just out of box. Um, so whether that be like database configuration changes, um, approaching max MySQL connections or some examples, we have a, a pretty long list. You can alert quickly on those events. So I yep. can select that event, I can choose the host that I wanna set up that alert on. Um, or that event alert on, um, and then I can leverage some of our native integrations we support. So today, right, scroll down. I want to show those. So here, here yeah. are some of the ones that we have already set up in this demo environment. Yeah. Um, but what I'll do is I'll jump and show you the specific integrations that we support. So um, we can email Nick. Nick will fix everything. We can, yeah. Yes. We can just send everything to Nick. Nick. Um, yeah. So you can see we with today we support PagerDuty and Slack, um, Ops Genie, Victor Ops, um, email. Yeah. Uh, if we want to send it to Nick. Um, and then um, also a custom webhook if it's something we don't right. support natively. Right, the custom webhook, I, I like that as well. That's a, a nice uh, add on there. Yeah, um, and then the other thing I wanted to touch on for alerts is also metric-based alerting okay. um, and threshold-based alerting. So if we capture that metric, we can set up the alert um, and uh, you know quickly get an idea of exactly what we should be alerting on. So for instance, the example we give there uh, is you know CPU load average. You can see how it also auto-completes for me so I can make yes. sure I'm finding the right metric. But when I get a nice little interactive graph here, um, so I can say, you know, let's set up a threshold-based alert when it exceeds 15 and recovers at 13, and we'll be able to see exactly what we're setting up there. Oh, that is nice. I hadn't seen that yet. That is very nice. Okay. Nice interactive way to set it up. So uh, being a Microsoft SQL Server uh, person, right, I see that word profiler. Mm -hmm. What's profiler look like? So we got a little dose of it in the Explorer. Okay. Um, this is gonna rank, sort, and filter all of our queries running across all of our selected hosts. Um, and by default, we are looking at the most time-consuming queries. Um, this is gonna allow you to organize in a bunch of different ways. You can see we're looking at top 20 queries by total time right now. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that insert statement across all 57 hosts is about 28% of our runtime or about right under nine hours of wall clock time in the past hour. Um, and what we can do here is just quickly identify outliers. So you know, in the past hour on average, show me my longest running queries, as well as those fast and frequent. So, you know, a lot of the folks using those custom scripts or maybe a slow query log, some of those would miss those fast and frequent, which of course can, you know, consume a good amount of time across my database. So, and again, this is uh, all queries across all hosts, everything that's been collected. Right. So if I wanted to filter by uh, again, it's if I would filter. Uh, sure, yeah. So the top filter the host. Yeah. yeah, let's go ahead and filter on just type equal to MySQL. Yeah. Um, and we can make sure that we're now looking at just 19 of those 57 hosts. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that insert statement now that we just talked about, which was much lower, mm -hmm. is accounting for about 80% of total runtime for our MySQL hosts. That's good. Um, yeah, and you can see we can, again, click on any of those and we'll get to that additional metrics query details page. Uh, and you can see some of these. We actually have some failed warnings, best practice recommendations, where we can quickly jump into those and see what we can do. I love the best practice recommendations, and I'm going to assume a lot of that uh, knowledge came from Baron. It did. Yeah, yeah. a lot of our, um, you know, Baron. He he built a lot of this tool and did an excellent job. Uh, and then a lot of our CS team are just, you know, very very talented. So okay. they, they built a lot of these recommendations and tools as well. So one of the things that has been built into uh, DPA is a lot of uh, wait time. Wait time response analysis. So the, uh, all the relational database systems, they all uh, have the concept of logging what the weight is for that particular query. Is there any weights inside of DPM? So I think what we've done, and we looked at it a little bit um, earlier, is we kind of flip that on its head. So okay. we kind of look at the top of the funnel, um, you know, a spike in CPU, um, you know, a spike in weight for a specific query. And then what we can do is try to identify the specific query that's lining up with, say, a spike in CPU or long wait times. Excellent. Um, and then from there, drill down and look at some of those recommendations that we were just we were just talking about. Okay. So it's uh, the way I want to put it is that the data being collected in a lot of ways between the two tools is just very similar. It's just how is the data being presented to the end right. user for consumption? Because both tools offer a great deal of observability into the layer, especially inside a database engine, which is this mysterious unknown for a lot of people. All right. So you're getting the observability in that database layer, and the data, it's kind of all the same. It's all the same system views and information. You know, the CPU of a, of a host is the CPU of a host. Right. It's being used or not. 
uh, it's just a matter of how do you want to present that in a way for the audience to consume it so then they can take the right actions at the right time. Right. And this is what I love about the tool is that it's taking a lot of that information that says, no, let's show it in this way, a way that is very uh, familiar for that audience, say the devs, the DevOpsy folks. Right. And because uh, they're used to seeing this type of input. This is what they really want. So for us to be able to offer that, I think, is just amazing. Right. Yeah. Uh, let's talk notebooks. Okay. Yeah, this let's is, jump to notebooks. This is one of my favorite features, is the notebooks. So, so it's sitting right there, and I've been dying to ask about it. So yeah, notebooks is going to combine basically everything we've looked at so far into a dynamic document. So what we can do here, you see we have one um, that we're hovered on now, but it's going to have um, you know basically links to different areas of the app. It's going to have um, different dashboards that we can embed in these, and we can make sure to export these and share them with the folks that need to be shared with. Um, and then we have a bunch of other templates that we can use here. Um, so for instance, we can look at you know, deployment run books, we can do code deploy checks, environment inspections, and what this does, as soon as I kind of deploy this into a notebook, it'll start populating from my environment. So I can make sure to choose the right hosts, the right time ranges, so I can do a quick environment inspection and see how I'm, how I'm performing over that um, selected time range. So uh, I have just come across notebooks, say recently, last three years mm -hmm. of my life, uh, as I've pivoted a little bit to being more uh, data science, data analyst. And so I get to fool around a little bit, not just with Python, but with Jupyter Notebooks. Okay. So when I saw this feature and I started to understand the real power behind it, the ability to share knowledge between silos. So everybody can, that you want can have access to this tool. And this is kind of your run book. This is kind of the idea that, hey, this thing happened at this time. Let right. me show you. And this is what I had to do to solve it. And maybe we should go and fix it. or. Uh, now, can we embed data sets inside the notebook as well? You can, okay. yes. So I know the one we discussed recently and yesterday was like postmortems. Yeah. So your page in the middle of the night, I'm going to put together a notebook, um, a run book, so that you know the next person doesn't spend an hour like I spent, but maybe 10 minutes so they yep. can resolve quicker. Um, but you can see some of those. We have um, you know, some of the ones that you're mentioning, like mm -hmm. a, a run book and some environment inspections. But if I scroll down a little bit further, let's pick an exciting one here. Um, you can see that this is going to reflect a lot of different areas of the app where I can look, where I can route to. Um, and then if I look at this environment inspection as well, you'll see as I scroll down, we're going to get those, um, those charts that we want to look at um, specific to our resources, specific to system performance. Um, so all of this, you know, you can customize, you can embed. As long as you can do it in Markdown, you basically can do it in Notebook. Right, right. So uh, the question I have right now, because I haven't asked it of you yet, is when you're doing a demo of this tool, what's the aha moment for the customer, right? When they're looking at it going, and what, what are you showing when the next question is, how much does this cost? <laughs> so there, there are some really good workflows. Um, I think something that you know, every customer values is the ability to drill down so quickly. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna profile my workload, I'm gonna look at the most time consuming query, and I'm gonna grab a sample and look at an explain plan within two clicks. Yes. Um, so that's something that's really just easy to use. Um, you know, and then we have some other really, really useful workflows. I think something that people really like is the ability to compare time ranges. Okay. So this is something we show quite a bit. So for instance, if we want to look at an hour over hour comparison um, and look at the relative change across my entire workload, I can do that. So you know, customers, and I know something you mentioned earlier is like DevOps, which is a very heavy role um, that you know spends a lot of time in here. So you know, customers, one of our largest customers, GitHub, all their engineers will own their code. So when they deploy code, they all log in here and they make sure that you know, they're not seeing anything they don't anticipate. Um, okay. So in app deployment would be a great use case here to compare time ranges and make sure that there's nothing happening that they didn't expect to so kind the, of go on there. So the employees, so GitHub employees yeah. use DPM right. in order to make sure that the code they deploy to run GitHub right. has no issues right. that they weren't uh, expecting. Yeah, they, they all log in right okay. after deployments. They, they know what parts they own and they know that what they need to pay attention oh, to. I, see, I didn't know that. I, I think I'd heard GitHub was a customer, but I hadn't really thought about how they were using it, especially in that DevOps type role. Right. If it's good enough for them, right. it's got to be good enough for, uh, yeah. They're leading the charge. They do it really well. So a question I have here is, how is it possible for me to compare just a, a couple of queries? I, I can see comparing a time range for an hour but what if I wanted to focus a little bit further? How would I do that? So yeah, within here, there's you know a lot of other data sets that we haven't had time to okay. look at yet. Uh, we can filter on specific query text. So we have a table in here called guestbook. You know, if I want to okay. filter on every query that interacts with guestbook, 
I can do that and then look at a, uh, like a comparative time range. Okay. Um, so if I want to filter down on any sort of query text, I can do that here. Um, so that would be your kind of way to make sure you can identify a specific query or a specific subset of queries. All right, cool. Uh, another question I, I kind of forgot about for uh, notebooks. Uh, something else I wanted to ask, but did I see, do you have uh, libraries and examples? We do, yeah. So I've, I've jumped okay. up here a couple of times. These are your templates. So you can start with a blank template um, where you can kind of get started and you know make something yourself. Uh, but these are the ones that our customers, um, that you know the folks we talk to on, on sales calls would find most valuable. Okay. So our CS team, um, has put together these um, where, again, if I kind of use one of these, it starts populating for my environment. I can make small tweaks, but... Um, so if, I, if you deploy one of those, it will start populating automatically for you? Right, so awesome. the one we, we popped up here earlier was environment inspection for okay. MySQL. And um, this is the markdown. Yep. Right, exactly. So if I go ahead and preview it, um, we're going to reflect these specific system metrics, these resource metrics for the environments that we're looking at. Um, so this is this is the environment we're looking at. This is the the MySQL host that we have selected. Okay, and you mentioned the postmortem, so I was going to ask, so with this type of um, ability to create a notebook, do you have customer stories where they tell you, look, I was a few clicks away, uh, I created this particular notebook visualization, I got in front of the manager or the person who actually holds the purse strings and said, hey, yeah, how much? Like, does that have that value? Right, yeah, so the flexibility in notebooks is incredible. I think a lot of our customers have used it pretty well. These are the actual templates. The ones we've created are the ones that customers have given us feedback and said this okay. worked for us. Awesome, that's what I was looking for. So uh, I think we're gonna cut, looking for some questions. I'll have help from the moderators if you have some to bring up. In the meantime, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the key points just to review. So uh, again, DPM, right, focuses on your open source platform. So we're talking Postgres, MySQL, Redis, Aurora, uh, and it complements the offering that we have for database performance analyzer, which is your historical relational database platform. So your Oracle, your SQL Server, uh, your Sybase DB2. God, we do a lot. Uh, we do RDS as well. We do Azure SQL Database. We can do it all. Uh, so that's one of the key differentiators. Another one, of course, is software as a service. So subs uh, subscription-based model is how you right. get to DPM. For DPA, it's traditional software licensing. Uh, DPM. Primarily, customers are dev and DevOps and some DBAs, where DPA, it's primarily a lot of DBAs, then some developers, some DevOps. Uh, sometimes I hear people that want to deploy us just to an uh, operation center, because right. they just need to know red, green, blue, and who to call next. And then that person ends up using our tool to right. do a little more diagnostic information. Um, uh, DPM has, all these dashboards are customizable? Yes, they are. Yes, that's what I thought. Uh, so that's another slight differentiator. DPA, you can make some customizations, and if you can crack open some XML, but it's not as, as user-friendly. Right. But DPM is very user-friendly when it comes to creating your own dashboards. And, and of course, the notebook feature is, is just amazing. Uh, if you need more information, I would tell you go to solarwinds.com, database-performance-monitoring-software. Uh, do we have some questions? We do. All I right. think you covered it pretty well there. Um, yeah, so the first question, and we touched on this a little bit, um, is there security over the access to, that um, we've been seeing on query details? Uh, for example, a financial firm um, with you know, personal corporate information, um, you know, probably adhering to PCI compliance here as well, but they could show up in the query and information must, must be restricted. So we talked a little bit about this. Uh, we have some flags. I'll actually pull it up here so we can see it a little bit better. Um, so right when we're installing the host, um, I can jump up here and make sure that, you know, for instance, I'm capturing a sample without that query text. Right. Um, and, you know, typically if, if people are really worried about it, I tell them to start here. Mm -hmm. um, we do have ways to purge samples. So if you install incorrectly the first time, make sure you get rid of those. Uh, and then, you know, using config files, you can get the whole way down to specific query text you want to avoid. So you can whitelist, you can block list specific query text. Um, and we do have a lot of folks um, in that space. So FinTech, FinServices, mm -hmm. even healthcare that are here adhering to HIPAA and PCI compliance as well. Awesome. Uh, next question. Um, you briefly mentioned the data retention windows of three days of one second granularity and 30 days of one minute. Um, what if my organization needs something different, like 30 days of one second and or six months of are one minute? Are they customizable? They are. Um, they are customizable. As I mentioned, um, even adhering to like HIPAA standards, I think you need to have like three years worth of data retention. So uh, we have ways to customize it. Um, you know, whether it's the granularity and time ranges of the granularity, as well as just the length of historical data retention. So um, that they are completely com customizable. Now, if they needed to customize it by um, database being monitored, would that be, would they need a different agent? 
or can they, is that, is it that granular? Uh, you should be able to customize it by database. Okay, yeah. cool. So we have a, a bunch of different um, config files and places we could make sure we're only capturing and what we want to capture as well as the historical data retention and we want to capture. I would just assume the more data you capture means probably a bigger bill on the other end. A little bit, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, so be, be, if, the, if the CSO comes to you and says that I need seven years of data, <laughs> you should remind them that right. might be a, a bit more of a cost because that's right. how subscriptions work. Right. All right, next question, if there is one. I think so. Uh, yeah. Yes, we do have another question. Can you go over areas of the product where you can compare metrics? Um, so we talked and showed a little bit about Profiler, comparing those metrics. Um, you know, Explorer, I like to call it almost Profiler on steroids. Uh, so we can jump to Explorer here and get kind of those same views here that we were looking at earlier. But we also have the ability in here to compare time ranges. So not just that hour over hour that we were looking at for our you know, top 10 queries by total time, um, but also our resource metrics. So if I want to compare oh. CPU hour over hour, um, or, you know, it's pretty customizable if I want to compare uh, CPU, um, the most recent hour of CPU compared to one week prior, the exact same hour. So I can do gonna, that as I'm well. Gonna, I'm going to touch the screen real quick. So you're showing me, now. Th so this is for all queries and that spike, and the CPU is the entire CPU for the hour. Okay, got right, it. Right, so this is the most recent hour here. Yep. This is the hour before, and it looks like, you know, this is pretty they, consistently exactly. the top query. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And we look, it looks like we have some queries dropping off, picking up probably from a, you know, a code deployment that we're pushing on our demo environment. Awesome. Uh, any last questions before we sign off? Uh, is the product licensed per user or per database instance? Um, so today it's per database instance. License okay. is a database instance, um, and we give volume discounts um, for those situations where we get into like microservices and stuff like that. Um, and then we actually, it's, it's unlimited users. So you're paying for the database instance, it's unlimited users, and you're gonna get access to things like, which we didn't touch on, but SSO. So we have mm -hmm. um, you know, SAML, OAuth, access to all that, unlimited users. So if you wanna share something, instead of having to export it outside, just you know, send a quick link that we have to, to Vivid Cortex or DPM, um, and they can log in and make sure that we're looking at exactly what um, we were looking at. Now you mentioned microservices and volume. Uh, what were we talking there? Um, yeah, so we have, we actually have a wide variety of um, folks that are kind of, you know, more modern applications like GitHub, um, where they're deploying really frequently, um, continuous integration, continuous deployment, um, you know, always iterating. Um, but we work with a, a wide variety, so um, we make sure that we try to be flexible in our pricing because we know we have, you know, more micro, if you have microservices, you're going to have more instances, you're going to have like a service for application. Um, we also work with folks that are, you know, kind of in the process of decoupling and they can use us uh, to do that as well. Now, are the microservices usually in the development environment, or are people like spinning up a lot of stuff in production, or? Yeah, so that's, that's another good, uh, a good point. So we have folks that don't just monitor production environments. Mm -hmm. um, so the, you, know, you can logically separate them. Actually, if I jump up here, um, you can see how we can logically separate these. So um, yes. it might be production, it might be staging, it might be development, okay. um, and we can kind of you know, watch it as we progress it and push it through to production. Um, so you have the ability to make sure you do that. We actually have one customer that uses Vivid Cortex to confidently push right to production. So, so no one else. Um, they, they say they're saving tons of money, so it's pretty impressive, but I, right to I production. Do, I do all my best work in production. Right. You're less likely to make mistakes, right? Did we get one more question, I think, or no? We I did? think there's something coming in. Uh, as a monitoring engineer who is neither a DBA nor DevOps person, is DPM a good choice to try? Um, I think also one of the big differentiating factors of DPM uh, is that we try to make it usable for everybody. Um, so not just your expert who can jump in here um, and knows exactly where to look, but we try to give you those templates, um, you know, good use cases to use to be able to identify opportunities for improvement. So we have like more of the novice. Um, we have you know experts using the product, uh, a wide a wide range of folks that um, find value out of DPM. Awesome. Any final questions before we wrap this up? I see somebody else coming through. Uh, the product seems to scale really easily, but how useful is it for looking at smaller one server environments? Um, just as valuable. Um, so, you know, it is, it's one of our use cases here is the, the ability to kind of have everything in one view. So whether it's different database types, um, you know, whether it's a high volume of a specific database type, if it's one database instance, uh, we have tons of customers that have started that way and, and we've scaled alongside them and we have, you know, probably 50% of our customers that have one or two licenses and is monitoring one or two databases. So um, in those situations, um, still really valuable, um, just kind of at a smaller scale and heightened so you can kind of put a magnifying glass um, against those two databases or those single database that you're looking at. 
All right. Uh, I think we're good. I think we've answered all the it. questions that have come through. Yes. I want to uh, thank you, Hansel, for being here again today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no Appreciate problem. It. Come back anytime. All right, I'll you do that. You did great. <laughs> See, this wasn't so bad. <laughs> Not too bad. And I want to thank you for watching us here on SolarWinds Lab.